Lymphomatoid papulosis and anaplastic large cell lymphoma, so those fall into that CD30 positive bucket. Oftentimes, this one presents just as a tumor. And it's important to, to ask the history and to do a whole skin exam to say, is there anything else anywhere else? Do you have those patches, those flat rash areas like mycosis vangoides, or did you just pop up with just that one? Lymphomatoid papulosis looks totally different. And it really is one that people think is acne for a while or bites or something like that. And eventually these little pink bumps pop up and they get crusty and they get scabby. And then they heal over sometimes with a small scar. Um, and lymphomatoid papulosis is technically not lymphoma. We include it in our lymphoma classification because it's associated with other cutaneous lymphomas. There's an increased risk for a cutaneous lymphoma, but it in of itself um, is not a lymphoma. So what exactly does CD30, what does that mean? Um, so I thought I'd present to you a very, very simplistic view of what CD30 means and um, give you a very simplistic view of the immune system. So as you know, the immune system in, in, um, has very, very many different cells. Um, the more, most common types are T cells, which are depicted here which can be either CD4 positive or CD8 positive. We have B cells um, and NK cells that are also part of the immune system. And the, the job of, of your immune system is to be able to distinguish and get rid of foreign entities like bacteria and viruses. And so CD30 is a cell surface protein. So it's a protein that's expressed on the surface of these cells and typically when they're activated. So um, CD30 is on the um, surface of these cells and when they bind the ligand or its ligand, CD30 ligand, um, this is present on B cells, T cells, eosinophils and macrophages, which, which are other cells in the immune system. Signals uh, occur within these cells that then help modulate the decision to undergo cell death or cell survival. So very simplistic view, but just to give you an overview of what that, what CD30 really means. And so CD30 is really mainly a histological distinction, um, meaning CD30 was used as a way to really classify these disorders. And so when you um, have a skin disorder and require a skin biopsy, um, Typically, this is what you, what the pathologist looks at when a, your dermatologist takes a piece of your skin. And so the tissue is processed and dyed, um, you know, colored in certain ways. And this is really what the pathologist sees in all types of skin biopsies. So um, he or she sees a cross section of a piece of skin and you can see um, the top layers of the skin here. Um, and these dark, colored um, areas are the cells in your skin. So each of these um, biopsies can have a specific pattern of inflammation of cells. So the way that these cells are arranged in the skin clues in the, the dermatopathologist as to what particular diagnosis they're dealing with. And each individual disorder has very specific findings. And so they can further stain the skin biopsy to look for cell surface proteins like CD30. And this is what's depicted here. So that kind of gives you an idea as, as to what that means. So CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, um, it's actually the second most common cutaneous lymphoma, second only to mycosis fungoides. And because CD30 um, positivity can be seen in a variety of things. It can be, um, you can stain for CD30 under um, and look under the microscope and see it in things like eczema, um, bug bite reactions. Um, it can be seen, of course, in lymphomatoid papulosis. It can also be seen in other lymphoproliferative disorders like mycosis fungoides. So it's very important to take both the clinical presentation as well as the biopsy findings in order to make the diagnosis because CD30 positivity and the findings under the microscope can represent a number of disorders. 
So lymphomatoid papulosis, um, as we know, is a um, group, um, a recurrent self-healing grouped or scattered papulonodular eruption of the skin. Um, as I alluded to earlier, it is um, a CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorder, and it is the most common type, but it is overall very rare. So um, it's estimated to um, the incidence is about 1.2 to 1.9 cases per million persons in the United States. Um, there's a predilection for um, men versus women, and it can occur at any age. So there are pediatric cases of um, um, patients with lymphomatoid papulosis, but the average age of onset is anywhere between 35 and 45 years with a peak at the fifth decade. Um, there are many different um, hypotheses as to why lymphomatoid um, papulosis occurs in some people versus, the, versus others, um, but really the cause is um, unknown. And there are some genetic mutations that have been identified and reported, but as to the clinical significant significance of these mutations, it's really not clear. So the, in terms of prognosis and associated malignancies, um, the survival um, 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 estimation, um, fiber survival is actually very, very good. It's close to 100%. Um, so there's a controversy in terms of regarding lymphomatoid papulosis as a benign versus malignant um, disorder um, because the survival is, is very, very good. Um, that being said, um, there is a um, relatively high um, risk of secondary malignancies, and there are various um, estimations. So anywhere between 5 and 30 percent, some have estimated 40 to 60 percent. Um, and most of these malignancies um, include um, mycosis fungoides, um, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, typically the primary cutaneous type or Hodgkin's disease. So oftentimes these um, secondary malignancies, um, they, um, mycos in terms of mycosis fungoides, it's typically early stage. So um, patients um, tend to present with stage 1A and, and, or 1B. And the interesting thing is that um, most patients with lymphomatoid papulosis and mycosis fungoides um, the prognosis with regards to their mycosis fungoides is better than um, um, compared to others. So less common associations, less than 10% include different types of leukemia, AML, CML. B-cell lymphoma has also been um, reported, myelodysplastic um, syndrome, and multiple myeloma. But these are very um, uncommon secondary malignancies. So risk factors for these secondary malignancies, male sex, um, uh, older age, and um, there are specific types or subtypes histologically of LYP that I'll discuss in, um, in a brief second. So the clinical presentation of lymphomatoid papulosis, so this is the classical um, presentation. They, again, typically occur in groups or crops, and they can present in different stages of healing. Um, there's um, a size distinction between lymphomatoid papulosis and other disorders, particularly primary cutaneous ALCL or anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So in lymphomatoid papulosis, that they're usually less than two centimeters in size. Um, so about half of patients are asymptomatic, um, but the other half can have either severe pruritus or itching. Um, sometimes they can have pain um, associated with the necrotic lesions. Um, and most of the time it can take weeks to months to heal completely. And they often heal at different stages and different times. Sometimes they can leave um, darker spots or lighter spots or hyper hypopigmented spots. Um, some patients can also have scarring, particularly the types that involve the um, blood vessels and have necrosis. But the general rule and the general feature for lymphomatoid papulosis is that they always self-resolve and go away. So, um, so these are some pictures. I'm showing you some of the presentations. So um, some patients can have very few lesions um, affecting their skin. Some can have hundreds affecting their trunk, their 
extremities, which are the most common areas of involvement. Um, and then some, sometimes they can heal with this um, central crust or ne necrotic or eschar. Um, and again, um, it's more common in um, types of lymphomatoid papulosis that involve blood vessels, but it, it can occur in other types as well. Um, so treatments. Um, you may hear your um, you may hear your team talking about what are called skin directed treatments versus systemic treatments. Most of the time, we're lucky enough in um, in the system to do what are called skin directed treatment or uh, for um, hemicutaneous CD30 lymphoproliferative disorder to do um, skin directed treatments and. May I take a moment to apologize? I have a three-year-old at home and I, I apologize that she is crying in the background. Hopefully that will go away in a minute. Um, and so um, I apologize for that. But so we have treatments that are called skin-directed versus systemic. Skin-directed is where we're not asking you um, as a patient to take any treatments by mouth or by IV. Um, we're um, using treatments directed completely to the skin only. So that includes things that you have probably used in the past or have heard of like topical steroids or skin directed treatments. Um, radiation is a skin directed treatment. Phototherapy is a skin directed treatment. Um, and so those are what some of the most common things we use. The systemic treatments that you may have heard of are methotrexate, um, that we use um, quite a bit. And in very, very rare cases, something called brotuximab vidotin, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more shortly. So the skin-directed treatments um, we like because you have limited side effects and there's no need for laboratory monitoring. So if someone has a few local lesions of LYP um, or one um, larger lesion of permacutaneous ALCL, we may actually try you on topical steroids first because it has um, a good track record of response, but it also has limited side effects. It's not like taking a, to um, a topical steroid orally, which many people have done maybe for an allergic reaction. Um, like you're not gonna gain weight or, have, or stay up at night longer or have the risk to your bone structure that you would with um, oral steroids. Those are not um, side effects with the topical. So a lot of times we want to try that so that you get a response, but that you're also not having um, side effects. Phototherapy, we like to use a lot more if um, someone has extensive lymphomatoid papillosis. So we definitely understand you can't go around like trying to um, put the steroid on each individual spot. So um, there, we might um, talk to people about a skin-directed treatment called phototherapy where you come into your dermatologist's office and you get light therapy. It's the same thing that is emitted by the sun, the ultraviolet light, but in certain incremental doses that we can measure and increase um, about two to three times per week. So it can be very, very time intensive. Um, and then the last one that we, we categorize as more skin directed is radiation and therapy. And that's if you have a larger lesion on your skin that's not responding, um, we may then subject you to um, unfortunately having to go to radiation, but it's a localized treatment. Um, it's very rare that I end up in my patients having to do that. Luckily, we see a lot of response with the first two, um, but there are definitely times where I've had to rely on radiation and it's, it's been quite successful. Um, we also, in some cases, like if someone has really extensive disease and they're not responding to the phototherapy, that's when I, I as a clinician, start thinking about um, doing something like methotrexate, which is an oral medication that you take once a week. Um, in really high doses, it is chemotherapy where people do have the typical chemotherapy effects like hair loss. Um, with the doses that we're using in LYP and permacutaneous ALCL are typically much lower in their oral doses that you take at home. Um, and we have seen good success with that. 
if you're um, if you and your physician um, healthcare team decide to go that route, there is blood monitoring that's needed um, as you go through the process. And it's something that we don't look at as curative. It helps to bring down the burden of disease. So after you stop, you may still have a few lesions that come up here and there, but our goal is to decrease the frequency and the number of lesions that come up. Lymphomatoid papillosis patients need to know that they have a, they have a relatively rare and unique skin condition uh, that is a marker of risk for lymphoma. I think that first and foremost, the lymphomatoid papillosis needs to be treated in an appropriate manner. Patients may get a few lesions uh, or patients may get lots of lesions. Lots of lesions that break down get secondarily infected. So the aggressiveness of the treatment of lymphomatoid papillosis needs to be individualized to each patient and each circumstance. The second thing is that regardless of what treatment we use for lymphomatoid papillosis, how aggressive we are or not aggressive, it had, the treatment of lymphomatoid papillosis has no impact on the future risk of developing a lymphoma. And so it really is, I'll say, symptomatic relief of the skin lesions and that um, uh, there really is nothing we can predict that will tell us uh, that a lymphoma may or may not be coming down the road in up to 10 to maybe 15% of the time. Mm -hmm.